want to get to the intersection of business, science, and politics. Just in the last week, we've learned about some huge breakthroughs in gene editing and biotech to cure diseases. But at the same time, some of those very labs making these discoveries are having their federal funding cut. Joining us right now to talk about it all is Walter Isaacson, Perella Weinberg Advisory Partner, Tulane University history professor, and author of many, many best-selling biographies, including Elon Musk, and maybe more specifically uh, to this topic, Codebreaker, yeah. your 2021 book that took a look at where we are on this uh, brave new world in terms of what we are coming up with. It's the biggest revolution happening other than AI. Yeah. And the code breaker was about using new gene editing tools called CRISPR that Jennifer Dowda and others created. And now this past week, we've seen Sam Sternberg at Columbia, who was a graduate student of Jennifer, use jumping genes to be able to put new genes when somebody has a genetic illness. Likewise, David Liu won the Breakthrough Prize. And it was very moving to be there to watch the 17-year-old he had cured and just last week announced another cure for an infant and by nine using and a half this. Baby, a nine and a half month old and, baby. But what makes it really sad yeah. is the devastation of these labs happening right now. At Harvard, which is where David Liu is, Columbia, they're just having to fire everybody. I mean, I'm, I should say everybody, but decimated, really firing more than half the people, bringing on no new... So we're going to quit this research that kept America in the vanguard. I, I mean, I think this is so important. I, I, when you were talking about CRISPR in 2021, I thought it was still at least a decade away, if not two decades mm -hmm. away. What we have seen over the last four years has been astounding. Uh, people are being saved from diseases that would have killed them. Uh, it's six especially ago. these rare genetic diseases, but you'll soon see it with cancer. We're already seeing some of that, which is immunotherapy requires using it. And we have three major attacks on this. One is just the cutback on research and development. For 80 years, our nation has led, since Vannevar Bush and Harry Truman and uh, Roosevelt at the end of World War II, created government-funded basic research, which led to CRISPR, which led to the Internet, which led to search engines, which led to America being the strongest, most innovative nation. That's being cut. Secondly, there are targeted attacks because of anti-Semitism, which I get. It's important to fight that. But when they attack a university for anti-Semitism, say Harvard or then Columbia, it's the, actually the graduate students in the labs doing science research that get hurt, because that's the government so, grants that get cut. Can I ask you, someone who knows Elon Musk yeah. probably better than just about anybody else, and whether you think about this in the context of Doge or whether you think about it just in t the context of the administration or USAID or all of the things, mm -hmm. which in very many ways are all interrelated, right. he thinks what about what you're discussing right now? Well, I don't channel his thoughts at the moment, but I know that he understands that research and development is what got us into space, got the type of things he's done, allowed right. GPS to be widespread. So it affects every business, whether it's Tesla, Starlink, and all. I do think that he and anybody who has been in a technology business understands that the seed corn for innovation is research in basic science. And when you cut that for either political reasons, because you're targeting a university, or you just want to cut back somehow National Institute of Health funding, or, uh, it, it, or you have a fear of the letters RNA, well, which is what some people have. Look, the biggest issue is everything is facing cuts. The only ones that aren't going to get cut are, cuts are the ones that have the biggest, loudest lobbyists. And I'm not sure that the research and development have the biggest, loudest lobbyists. I think, getting too, that people are mistaking the fact that, oh, we don't like elite universities. And I get it. Maybe there were some problems and everything from anti-Semitism. And so you want to attack it. But why is the it that the, it. The, the blows to those universities, the grants you're cutting, aren't, you know, for Article admissions offices. Right, right. It's for research and development in basic science, especially life sciences, that's saving lives now. And we are letting go of doctoral students and the graduate students it's a brain this drain. work. I, I think you make the point that the big issue is we could lose a lot of them to China or to right. European universities. Oh, absolutely. We now have seen in these clinical trials and these things you talked about that happened the past few weeks yeah. in which people are being cured of genetic diseases, there are now more clinical trials in China than there are in the United States. 
For 80 years, we've led the world. When you start seeing more basic research and clinical trials being done in China, you know that's not going to be good for the next decade. It's not just the funding issues. It's also whether you have the regulatory structure to allow those things to happen. The FDA yeah. has kind of been gutted um, over the last two months. Right, right. And it's a complicated thing you were talking about, Regeneron having all of our DNA right. now because of 23andMe. In China, you have no privacy protections that way we hope we could have here. So there are a lot of complex regulatory issues, but the main one right now isn't, is there too much or too little regulation on health research? It's why have you decided to just get rid of all this basic science funding? Love this. I, I would love to have you back to talk more about it. Very quickly while you're here, though, why don't we talk about uh, the business world's relationship with the White House at this point? Mm -hmm. Where are we? It's complicated with tariffs. We just saw this huge tour in the Middle East with a lot of investment mm -hmm. that came in as a result. I think um, you've got a transactional president. You know, we, we always look at president. Are they realists or are they idealists on foreign policy? It's interesting to see one that's pretty transparent, meaning that, you know, President Trump is very transactional and brought, you know, the head of NVIDIA, the, you know, Elon Musk, of course, was there, all to the Middle East. And I think this is a major rebalancing in this world. We used to have a world of China, maybe Europe, the United States, the U.S. alliance with NATO and, and Western Europe. And now you see a transactional, uh, in many ways, great investment things being done in AI in which the Persian Gulf states are the ones that will be part of a new economic alliance with the U.S. I have an AI-related question yes, for you while we have you here, which is, it's a Grok, it's again an Elon Musk question. Sure. It's a Grok question. You've seen some of the stuff about white supremacy in mm -hmm. South Africa that's shown up mm -hmm. uh, last week on, on Grok. Mm -hmm. How do you think that happens? Do you think that that happens by accident? Do you think it happens because it's directed by some? What do you think is going on when I think we're seeing that, stuff like that mm -hmm. appear? I think all AI is as good as the training, uh, the data upon right. which it trains. And mm -hmm. one of the things that Musk got almost serendipitously when he bought what was then Twitter was he got the billion tweets a day as training ground for the new AI company he was starting. And so I think that's one of the reasons. Are there people there trying to please the boss and put a finger on the scale when it happens? I don't know, but I will say that Grok AI is actually now better in terms of timely things. Oh, I think for, time, for timely things, and, if you just want to know about right. the news, most and of the time I it's much better. I think that it's really good to have many competing AI companies, right. which is why I hope OpenAI stays a bit open with its source, because if you have one that goes off the rails and decides to be politically this way or that, we don't want to have just two or three AI companies. It's useful to have six or seven. 